God's grace and His goodness are yours in abundance. Through Jesus, the bread of life, in whose name we'll begin with prayer this afternoon. Lord Jesus, as we meditate on Your Word today, fill us up, satisfy our hearts with the good news of Your grace, that we don't feel a need to look anywhere else except to You to find our hope, our joy, and our treasure in this earth. In your name we pray. Amen. We have a word in English that we use to describe something that is not only the best, but that you can't surpass it. You can't find something that could possibly be better than it. Sort of like you're climbing to the top of a mountain, and when you get to the top, there's nowhere else to go. You've reached the end, as high as you can go. If you haven't guessed it by now, perhaps by looking at the slide over there, that word is ultimate. Ultimate. The, the idea that you have achieved the greatest that is possible and found the best thing that there is, the last thing, the, the, the farthest thing, the, the, the thing that cannot be surpassed by anything. As human beings, our lives are, in a sense, oftentimes devoted to finding something that is the ultimate. Really, it could be anything. Maybe, maybe you like sushi, and so you could drive around this city that we live in, and there are hundreds of sushi shops tasting each one to find the ultimate plate of sushi. Or take tea, for example. For me, I thought tea was nothing more than going to a grocery store and buying a flavor of it in a box. But my friend Chiang has opened to me a world of tea that I didn't know existed, such that there is a tradition behind a tea and a flavor behind that tea that you might be willing to travel across the world to, to get and to taste that most amazing kind of tea. When I was a young man, I um, lived over in Europe for a year, and I heard about the city of Naples, and that they supposedly have the best pizza in the world in Naples. So I found the best pizza place in Naples that could claim to be the best pizza place in the world. thought, I have to try this out. It wasn't what I was expecting, but it really was the ultimate pizza, because ever since then, nothing else compares to the pizza at this place called Da Michele. So if you're ever in Naples, try it. But it will ruin you for having pizza for the rest of your life, I warn you. See, the search for the ultimate anything can lead us on a lifelong journey. It can, it can uh, be frustrating, but it also can be exciting when we find what we think is the ultimate, the greatest, something that, that cannot be surpassed. I think we need to understand this word ultimate to understand what Jesus is talking about in our gospel lesson from John chapter 6 today. And, and we need to understand it because he doesn't use the word ultimate in the story that we read about. But what he's describing is that search for something that is the ultimate. And he understood that the Jews who saw him were looking for the ultimate bread. They lived in ancient Judah in Jesus' day, largely on what we would call a subsistence level. In other words, that people would plant crops, they would raise those crops and use those crops to feed their families for the coming year. Or they would catch the fish in the Sea of Galilee and use those fish to feed their family and sell some to buy what they need in order to, to survive day by day. If you're living at a subsistence level, though, all it takes is one famine, one drought, one bad season, and your family is suddenly in a lot of trouble. So for the Jews, the idea of the ultimate bread, the ultimate meal, wouldn't be finding some produce that's not in season in the grocery store or finding a great restaurant, it would be finding a constant 
and stable source of this good food. In fact, that's what is going on. Because if you recall in John chapter 6, the story that happened the day before this event was when Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 people. That's just counting the men plus the women and children. A crowd that huge with just two fish and five loaves of bread. How could Jesus do this except by a powerful miracle? And if he could feed a crowd of 5,000, couldn't he also be a sure source of food so that people no longer have to worry? I mean, if that's true, then he would be the ultimate bread king. In fact, that's what they thought. And if you read John chapter 6, it says the people grabbed Jesus and wanted to make him king by force so that he could be their free lunch ticket every day. So when Jesus is talking about being the bread of heaven, when they ultimately get to see him, Jesus is quick to tell them that it's not about having the ultimate meal, but about finding the ultimate in him, as we'll hear. Let's look at a few verses towards the end of our text, starting at verse 48. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So, Jesus is claiming to be the bread that came down from heaven. But what does he mean? What on earth does he mean by saying that? I mean, he isn't literally saying, I am a loaf of bread. So what is he talking about? I think the answer is, he's really talking about not being bread, but being the ultimate that would satisfy us. The Jews saw in Jesus the ultimate source of food. And for them, perhaps they thought back to those glory days of their past, which Jews are often fond of doing. And they thought back to the days of Moses when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt, as we talked about last week. And how God provided them with manna, bread from heaven, a constant and stable source of food for 40 years every day. If that was for them what they thought of as the ultimate, here Jesus could really be the ultimate. The ultimate bread king who could not only give them food every day, but could restore Israel to glory and get rid of the Romans. I mean, this is going to be the greatest thing. Well, I'd like to say since sliced bread, but that would be kind of a bit of a bad pun. See, the problem with finding the ultimate is how do you know that you've actually found it? Unless it's something like, say, Mount Everest, which at 8,488 meters is most definitely the ultimate mountain on Earth. It's the tallest one. You can't find one taller. Or perhaps Usain Bolt, who holds the world record in the 100-meter dash. He's, ultimate, he's the ultimate fastest man because no one has ever run 100 meters faster than him. You can't dispute that. But when you start talking about something else like what's the best restaurant in Vancouver, what is the ultimate place to go, uh, where's the ultimate place to retire, those kinds of things start to become difficult to sort out, right? If you have found the ultimate, the ultimate whatever it is, fill in the blank, then you know you've arrived. But if you can't be sure, then perhaps it leaves you feeling a bit uncertain and it leaves you searching still for what might be the ultimate. Now a minute ago I mentioned Mount Everest. It is the ultimate mountain on earth. But people say now it's no longer the ultimate mountain to climb. This is a picture of how many people are climbing Mount Everest, that they're in this giant traffic jam. There's 800 people 
who summit Mount Everest every year in the span of less than two weeks, because that's how long the climbing season is. So now the saying goes that if you want to brag about something at a birthday party, climb Mount Everest. But if you want to climb the ultimate mountain, the highest mountain and the hardest, you climb the second highest mountain called K2. It's in Pakistan. Leisha and I were watching a documentary about this this week. It made me think of that. And there was, in this documentary, they told us that only 308 people have ever climbed K2. And of those 308 people, one in four of them died after summiting. It's that dangerous and that difficult. Whereas Mount Everest, something like 6,200 people have reached the top, and only one in maybe 25 people will die uh, trying to climb Mount Everest. One of the people in that documentary, his name was Fabrizio Zangrilli. He's actually an American, even though it's quite the Italian name. Uh, he said that if you want to climb the greatest mountain, you climb K2. Because when you're at the top of K2, your life is literally in danger. In danger from the, the, the ice, in danger from just climbing it. But that's where you feel most alive. Because as you're climbing to the top of K2, you're pushing yourself to the ultimate boundary, and that was for him the ultimate experience. He goes back again and again, trying to make it to the summit of K2. But as you can see, if one in four die, the year, after, or the year before he, he made his documentary, 11 climbers died trying to climb K2 in one day. It was so, so devastating. If that's the case, what happens if we make our lives about searching for the ultimate, I don't know, fill in the blank with whatever you can think of? See, this is what Jesus is getting at. He says, Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. They had the ultimate source of food. Free food from heaven every day. No worries. Doesn't matter what the weather. God's going to feed them every day for 40 years. Yet they died. Their ultimate wasn't good enough. And if we make our lives about chasing after something, anything, the ultimate sushi joint, the ultimate cup of tea, what are we going to be left with, even if we find it? See, Jesus wants us not to look for the ultimate piece of bread, but to find in him the bread of life, the ultimate that can satisfy us. When we get to, and we start to understand him when he starts to say, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So he's talking about this ultimate bread, the ultimate food. Not to talk about finding something that is, tastes good, but to find in him something that satisfies us in a way that normal bread can't. The way a living bread can. That once we have eaten and tasted Jesus and what he has done for us, we'll be satisfied forever. This, my dear friends, is exactly what Jesus is getting at, isn't he? He wasn't coming to be some kind of bread king to satisfy this whim of the people. He isn't coming to be for us some God in the box who we can pray to and ask for stuff or uh, promotions or whatever it might be that we are ultimately looking for. Jesus wants to satisfy us and give us the ultimate of what we need, that we might be right with God and live forever. So when we hear what Jesus is saying to the people, we understand 
when he says, I am the living bread, that he is just saying, I am the ultimate. Period. End of sentence. You can't find something greater than Jesus. And even the words that Jesus is using to talk about himself are saying exactly that. You hear him saying things like, he comes down from heaven. Uh, he, is alone, he alone has seen the Father. He alone draws us to the Father. So that if we listen to Jesus, it's as good as if we're listening to God himself. If we heed Jesus' words, it's as good as if we are standing in the presence of God himself. If we believe what Jesus has done, then we are receiving the blessings, the greatest blessings, the ultimate blessings that God can bestow on anyone. Forgiveness of sins. Eternal life. Satisfaction. These are the kinds of things that Jesus wants us to see and that he's really backing it up by the way that he was speaking and by what he is going to do, paying the ultimate price for us. Of course, if you go out and say, I'm the ultimate, the world is going to scoff at you, kind of the way Susie did in that puppet show at Marty. And if we go around saying, Jesus is the ultimate, people are going to ask the same kinds of questions that the Jews were asking of Jesus. I'm looking at the beginning of our text. It says, at this, the Jews, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They understood that Jesus was talking about being the ultimate bread. They said, this, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Certainly, you understand that to go around saying you are the ultimate, or that you've found the ultimate, is going to raise some questions. People are going to challenge you and say, how can, how can you say you're the ultimate? How can Jesus say he is the ultimate, the best, that there's nothing beyond him that we need? How do you answer that? I suppose if you were to set out in search of the ultimate restaurant in Vancouver, maybe one way to figure that out would be to go and eat at all of them and figure out which one truly is the best. But how do you do that in a city where there's so many restaurants that if you were to eat at a restaurant, a different one, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, it would still take you more than five years to go to all of them? How do you do that? Maybe look on the internet. Maybe look at reviews. Maybe find out what people are saying and, and try those out. Well, that's what I did in search of the best restaurant. It turns out that the best chef in Vancouver is that man there. His name is Vikram Veej. And his restaurant comes in as the number one reviewed and number, it's on all the top ten lists for sure, but number one in reviews called Veej's. It's over in Fairview if you want to try it out sometime. Now I haven't, but people say it's the best. Well, how do you know if Veej's is the best restaurant serving you curry and Indian food? Well, Try it out, right? You go there. You sit down. You order some. And you find out for yourself, is Veej's worth all the hype? I guess there's only one way to find out. How do we know Jesus is the ultimate? Same way. If Jesus is the ultimate bread of life, the only way to find out is to taste of his grace. And this is what we do. We come before him to hear of his word and to listen to how Jesus did exactly what he says he was going to do in our gospel lesson, to give his life for the world. To give his flesh for the world that we might eat of him and find satisfaction. And that's what we do as Christians. We come to taste to taste and see that the Lord is good, that the Lord has satisfied us in forgiving our sins completely and freely, setting us free from the idolatry of, of chasing after something else that is ultimate, but ultimately fails, and finding in Jesus the ultimate, the one who 
loves us so much that he says, I leave heaven itself to come down and be with you and to give my life for you. Who else has said that? And who else has ever done that for you? That he says, I give you so completely of my life that in me you'll never be hungry, you'll never be thirsty, that we'll have ultimate satisfaction. When you have tasted that forgiveness, when you go back to the ba- your baptism and, and lay your sins there and say, Lord, forgive me for what I have done, there you find in Jesus that free and full forgiveness stretched out when he stretched his arms out on the cross and cried out to you, it is finished. In Jesus, we find the ultimate that the world can't offer. And so, as we said at the beginning, when you find the ultimate, really the only thing that is left is to sit down in the presence of that greatness and just take it in. That's what we're doing here, right now. Sitting down in the presence of the ultimate, our ultimate God, the ultimate man who gave himself for us, our Savior, our friend who's called us to be his own. And when we have experienced and tasted what Jesus is like, then we know deep down that our search is over. We don't need to look for something else. We don't need to climb a higher mountain. We don't need to search for a better place to find food. Jesus is it. He satisfies us. And so we come back. Not just on Sundays, but every time we open His Word. Every time we come to Him in prayer. Every time we gather with other Christians to be encouraged by what He has done for us. Because we find in Jesus the ultimate. So perhaps the next time you do find a great sushi place, you can tell me I actually like sushi. I'll go check it out too. And maybe you find a place that's so good, you're like, wow, this food is so good. This food is amazing. But then think to yourself this, but it can't compare to what I have found in Jesus, the ultimate my Savior. Amen.